updates to it continually. And then we have the elevator outage page. Um, we've recently added things like planned outage and scheduled maintenance, which wasn't always up there. Uh, we're making more and more changes about um, how you can take Trip Planner directly from the page um, and just making it more user friendly. So some of the stuff is, you know, super in the weeds, but if you're a user who uses that page every day, we're making the interface easier for you. Um, you know, next. So engaging staff and community. Uh, yep, so I did uh, speak about this, but I really do want to mention again, we had a first ever transit accessibility forum in May uh, with seven different transit agencies, LA Metro, uh, LA, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, uh, DC, St. Louis, I'm probably missing some others, uh, BART, which is also part of San Francisco. But we set up monthly calls, we've set up um, a working group, super, super informative what the transit systems are doing. And it was a big achievement for us. They all came to New York for a day workshop. They flew in. So it was, uh, I, I just have to give you some feedback that sure. it was announced the same day that, that you publicized it. And I tried to sign up for it. And it was closed that day. Yeah. Um, oh, the, the, the one event. event. That was the, the actual event. event. The workshop itself was from 9 to 5 and was private. It was agencies only. It was open to the public. Mm -hmm. We did have a it public forum in the evening that was you know, meant to have people involved. Um, we announced it, I think, two weeks earlier via a uh, thing, and uh, 200 RSVPs within 24 hours. Yeah, it, it so, helped look. And the place where we were at just could hold more, so. And, but, but that's a question why, you, when you're doing public events, can you put it in, can't you put it in a, a place? In a bigger place, potentially. I mean, <laughs> we partnered with the Transit Center. The MTA is not fiscally capable of paying agencies to fly in, so, you know, there was a partnership with the Transit Center who helped us arrange for them to stay here and be here, and it was in their space, and their space just had capacity, so we could do better next time. We also didn't think we'd get 200 RSVPs unless the pull out. You never know. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'll add, uh, it was overbooked, and I can tell you that, you know, since you and Byford have came in, there's been a lot of, a lot of advocating, a lot of support. Yeah. So it's showing that if people are going to show up, it's starting to meet sooner or later. Transit is going to have to find a bigger location. That's actually a good one. You should tell them that I'm all about it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll provide them with that feedback. Absolutely. Um, so again, uh, last thing is about trainings. We do specific trainings that specifically our team does for uh, special groups in the agency. And special means like GSMs. We've taken all of them and done trainings. Our elevator and escalator maintainers. Why is it important to know disability etiquette? They often deal with people right on the spot. We have done uh, pretty much all of our elevator supervisors and the majority, if not all, of our maintainers. Uh, we do our customer service folks individually. We do, we're do. we trying to get every every division in this building specifically at 130 through our own system-wide training where we spend an hour and a half or we bring in advocates. Um, and we've already got 200 folks done, but I think by the end of the year we'll, we'll probably be able to triple that number. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and those are very targeted, um, aside from their mandatory trainings and other things. So uh, we really, we, 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 again, training is, is, is a big thing at the top of our list. And there, you know, when we came in, there was a lot of room for improvement, so we, we tried to do that. Next. What? Ah, it's okay, it's cool, but. Uh, buses. All right, go back. All right, we're going to start with buses. We're going to talk about the accessibility features we have in buses. Then the next slide is about the things that we're working on. And um, look, um, I consider consider this a public forum, but also a friendly forum. Some of the things we're working on may not become a reality. So there's your disclaimer. Um, <laughs> but we're going to try them, and we're piloting them, and we're seeing where they're at. We have every interest in delivering as much as we can. Um, but look, some things may not work out. It's not going to stop in, in, in maybe prior transit years. We wouldn't talk about it, but we're going to talk about it, and uh, we're going to be open and transparent and see where we land. And, and maybe we can help you. What was that? Maybe we can help you. Maybe, everybody helps. Well, you can certainly help us with feedback while we're testing, and we do ask often mm -hmm. uh, many folks to help us. But uh, um, And then, yes, when, when it is fully fledged and fleshed out, potentially the community can help us to get features in. So wheelchair priority seating and additional priority seating, which you know is something that we have. Um, we are working, and I think Edith has been telling me this for years, 
Um, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. But Edith's told, told us. Me, Edith's told me a lot of things. But I tried <laughs> running him over. <laughs> <laughs> So we've been getting this complaint or, or this issue a lot about walkers on buses. Um, not specifically that they're on buses, but that... That are not folded. That yeah. aren't folded are or they're in the or middle. Or that they fell on top of me yesterday. Oh. Yes. Oh. Yeah, so that they're in the middle of the pathway, whatever it is. Walkers is to some degree an issue. They're absolutely a medical device that those belong on the bus and belong in the priority area. But how can we do a little bit better? In our new bus orders and some of the, the buses that you'll probably see over the coming years, and we're retrofitting some, you know how some of our seats in our buses, you pull the seat up, it flips yeah. three seats or four seats. Right. So we've right. designed them where they're either three by, we've, we've added the new spec and retrofit. It's going to take us some time. But where it's a three flip or one flip, two flip oh. or two flip, three flip or one flip or two by two flip. So different flip configura configurations where, if we do change our policy, which we haven't done yet, but if we have enough buses that have a single flip or a double flip, that we can make our policy, if a walker comes on board, the bus operator will flip the one seat mm -hmm. where the walker could go into the priority area and the other the person can sit right next to it, or that it could be, um, um, uh, you know, and everybody else can continue to use the seats. Um, can I just ask a sure. quick question on that? Is it the same rule for shopping carts? Some of us use... No shopping, only people. medical devices. Priority seating. Well, but some people, elderly people, like me, if I'm going to do a lot of shopping, I can't carry it, the stuff. So what is the rule then? Because it's like a walker. I even know some people who don't... Right. They it, use it, shopping the carts The FTA and the ADA don't consider a shopping cart the same thing as a walker. Yeah. And we follow FTA and ADA guidelines. So what, what is the rule so with, to, with shopping carts? Outside shopping. of the really good presentation, right? Shopping sure, carts. Sure. Yeah, 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 but it, it, it's, it's fine. I mean, um, uh, a, a walker is a medical device that is, uh, a belong, that is required to be in a priority seating area. A shopping cart is a shopping cart. Shopping carts must be folded or otherwise, um, you know, stored out of the way in getting our, our buses. If we were to allow shopping <coughs> carts into priority seating areas, we'd be taking them away from people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's not only my opinion, that's the opinion of the FTA. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes? Yeah, well, you know, when you talk about flipping the one seat, yeah. that does not resolve the issue for the wheelchair user who can't get through the walkers because none of the walkers are ever folded. If they do fold, but that's the shopping true. cart is always excuse me. The shopping cart is always full, and both sides of the front of the bus are completely filled with <coughs> walkers and shopping carts. Mm -hmm. look, and look, drivers need to understand the pediatric equipment that is a wheelchair. Uh, yes, that's also need all to other issues. We could spend three hours on but priority But this is seating. all the same we thing. Uh, look, Edith, I'm on it, but I will say this. This is a step in the right direction mm -hmm. where at least one walker could potentially um, be off to the side. If you got four walkers there, you got a whole other situation. If you got three shopping carts, you got another situation. This is one step in the right direction. The Can other steps that will follow, all door boarding, will have some new policies that will allow folks like shopping carts and strollers to potentially go to the back and do some things in the back. Yeah. There is a major difference between priority ADA seating mm -hmm. and courtesy seating. Right. Courtesy stuff we can do in the back and figure out whatever else. Okay, strollers you, and otherwise and shopping carts are courtesy could, and we can push them to the back in the future. But if you can designate those seats immediately behind the wheelchair spots. So the, the seats are already me. indicated. Uh, they're no, AD, they're no, priority. They're no, ADA no, priority seats. No, no. Excuse me, but the drivers. I'm sorry to say, luckily this training program is coming along. The issue is asking having drivers ask people to move to those seats immediately behind, particularly the walkers that do fall. I hear you. The seats immediately behind are also ADA priority mm -hmm. seating. I realize that, but, but no driver ever, seriously, tells people that. I hear you. Look, priority and seating is, is one of the English. most challenging topics. When you talk to other agencies, it's mm -hmm. very tough. 
Buses are crowded. There's a lot going on. People use buses for everything. The bus operators getting to enforce priority seating has caused all kinds of problems, not just here and in other places. Um, as you know, uh, there can be uh, unfriendly interactions. So, again, <laughs> let's move you know, on. Edith, I can talk really to you about priority seating yeah. forever. But Alex, how many yeah. how many physical uh, vehicles will that flip seat um, idea be tested on? Uh, it's only being tested on, on, on a few right now, but we put it into our spec. Some buses will arrive in the next two years. I'd like to think that we can get, in one year, maybe about a sixth of the fleet, maybe in two or three years, about a third. Is it on various routes or just one route? Uh, it depends on the type of bus. Oh. So uh, it is on, 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 on certain types of buses. Oh, so I think that, isn't it up to the discretion of the actual driver if a walker comes on the bus uh, to raise the actual wheelchair lift? Or no, any customer requested shopping car, I just want to use the lift. It, every customer requests a request the lift gets the lift. Yeah. Okay. There is no discretion at all. Okay. Well, if you don't, okay. Even if you don't use the medical device, if you're a customer yep. and you say, I want to use the lift, the operator must offer the lift. Folks, yes. please or the raise right, hands the right before hand. speaking so we yes. can. Can we just ask? Sure. Would you rather have questions as we go along or at the it's end? Your meeting. It, it, it's you. If you want to get through the, I don't know how long your presentation is. Well, so, um, I think we'd like to you, see. You're the you're doing again if you don't. I could talk through the whole thing. There'll be no time left for questions, or we could talk between it, mm -hmm. and we won't get through the whole thing. So I it's a tough thing. A week. But how about if you guys are okay? I can control the questions and take one or two. There you go. I'm just there trying there to be there. very yeah. different. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Being, yeah. I'm being very deferential. You better grow eyes in the back of your head. Then. I hear you. <laughs> 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 I know that. Me and you, me and you, we get around the block. Um, next, the ramps and lifts. A uh, couple updates on ramps and lifts. Yes, all our lift buses are gone on local routes. Express buses still do have, um, still do have those those lifts. As you know, we tested the low, the low vestibule bus. The test went really well. We are trying to see if we can order some as part of the next procurements of buses, which are happening now. But it has been a challenge, to be honest. One, there needs to be some design tweaks in the model that we saw. It wasn't ideal. Um, second, it is still a very rare product. It's very expensive. Based on procurement rules and other things, uh, we may not be able to sole source it, right, um, even if we want it. So we're really trying to figure out um, if we're going to do a real test. And bus, bus, buses are ordered much more often than subway cars. So even if we ordered some um, soon and got some of these express buses out there, we can test them. But there's some challenges, and the company needs to make some changes. But we, we want to see how whether in five years or ten years we can have ramps on express buses as well. We know that the lift solution on express buses is not ideal. That's the ramp and lift thing. Digital information screens. It's the one thing that everybody loves about us now. Um, <laughs> Plus have, the next one, automated. Yes, we're, which go together. So the, the screens are what make the announcements. So uh, the digital information screens um, uh, have been put in a lot of buses. They'll be in tons of buses, you know, 3,000 over the next year, and people will see them. We have gotten some feedback from our active committee and others. Uh, they generally announce stops. People would like them to also announce the route. Um, that sometimes when they open, they don't say this is the M35 going to wherever or whatever it is. So we're going to see if we can do that so customers on the outside can get it. The other thing we've heard from uh, specifically the blind community is uh, welcome aboard, which is the least important uh, item <laughs> on there, is the biggest and most contrasty, whereas the actual useful information is pretty small. Yes. So we are going to do a review of how content is presented on the screen, both for contrast and sizing purposes. So uh, hopefully we'll have an update, but that will take us a little bit of time. But it's on our radar. Yes? Uh, question, uh, is that equipment uh, changeable uh, in the case of where a bus stop is taken out of service for a fairly long period of time? Yes, absolutely. Still reading the old service line. Um, stop on 79th Street in Madison. Yes. I mean, it, it, first of all, it can be changeable now, but it is a manual process where we have to send an update. Once we get, um, and this it's the same system that sends messages to buses that sends to subways. It's part of our out-front digital content system. So both systems are being customized and we're still a year away. Even in the subway system, we have challenges in sending messages directly to one screen. 
If you want to send a message to only the Canal Street station, for example, um, it's still a challenge. We really can't do it. And at the same time, sending this a message to a specific bus or a specific route is still being built. But once we have much more capability in the future, we can send to one bus, we can take out stops, we can take out other things. To change it now, we literally have to pull all the buses in you know, and, and push a software upgrade, which is a pretty tedious process. Is, yeah. is the information sent by a human being, or is it done automatically? Well, right now, it's a human being that has to push the software update. In the future, it would still be a human being, but it would be centralized with much more branches and lines. Yes, sir. Steve, I was going to say something similar. So when they launched this on the B1 bus, uh, that, that is a hospital route, Okay, the, the, um, the uh, loudness of the announcement people find very effective. They like this, but like with Bert, there's a station that was eliminated three years ago, so on West 2nd Street, and they still announce that the stop is coming up. Uh, by, all, so, by, by the way, these so, systems are new, so the more feedback you can send directly to us, the better we can do. Um, we test it ourselves, but obviously we don't have the... The, the input that users do. So all that is super helpful. Once we figure out like one stop missing, it helps us figure out how to do that in the future. So please send us the feedback. And, and interestingly, for a while, these ha also had subway connections on them. I'm happy to say they've been removed because they were frequently incorrect. Okay. We need to get them all right. I'm sure they'll put them back. Because for it's instance, on the M86 SBS at Lexington, they had, you can transfer to the four and the five, but it didn't mention the six at all. Six, yeah. They were always, and, and on the bus announcements at 97th and Columbus, it said switch for the one, two, three, when actually the BC station at 96th and Central Park West was closer, right. and didn't even get a mention, so. Yeah, we, we still, with the content, we still have some work to do, but at least we're getting them installed, and they generally a good thing. I, I would say one thing, if you guys want to help us, it's not really with these announcements. Some of the pedestrian warning announcements, we've gotten a lot of volume noise complaints. Yes, mm -hmm. and, um, my community boy is going crazy about the caution bus turning. The caution bus, yes, which, is a, yes. which is a different system than this installed on the bus. So we need to figure that one out. But what, what, what is not helping us from a disability perspective or accessibility? That carries over to like, oh, you're just doing it for the blind, but you got to find another way. You know what I mean? We need enough people saying that these announcements are important from the public, so that you know we don't have a thousand complaints about noise, but nobody says these are still important to the blind. Is, is there any way of getting the caution bus turning just to go externally and not internally? Because people really get confused <coughs> when they're sitting on the bus and they start hearing caution bus turning. Oh, um, if it's an external, there's, there's, there, it's mainly external, but there's some volume issues. Yeah. We'll have an update. We'll have an update. We're going to lower the volume as a whole, That's and good. we're changing it's, it. And as long as it's still audible. Yeah, I'm telling you, yeah. I take on the M66 going across, when it turns onto Madison Avenue, it always says, you can hear it into, I take that bus all the time. Got it. And I have we will it look into bus. it. We're going to move on. Uh, what, what, one back little thing. Uh, Braille, Braille bus number signage. We've, we've started doing this. Um, we've heard from folks that it's like some places, not others. We are trying to figure out exactly where it is and where it's located on different uh, uh, on different uh, uh, buses, and let us get some more data on that. But we do put Braille signs in the bus numbers so people know uh, if they want to complain or whatever else. Inside the bus. Sorry? Is it inside the it's bus? It's inside the bus. Excuse me, but those signs are not on the new buses. On the, on the side, you know, the sign that has with the Braille and the bus number raised, the newer buses do not have that sign. They have it on the rail. I'll, I'll, I'll get it to you. Yeah, they have okay. it. We need to get better information as to where it yeah. is. And we're trying to put it on the back of the buses, too, so like when you're exiting That's the great. bus, it would yeah, be the there. front and the back. Yeah. So, uh, that, that would be a little hard for a Braille reader. Excuse well, me. Put it on they, the back they, they know where it is. They've said they can find it. Yeah. Let me move on. Yes, no, 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 no. I was going to say, I had a question, but I don't want to wait till later. Okay, yes. Next. So things in progress. I covered a lot of these already. Priority seating configurations. Increased and improved digital signage. I've already talked about this. Uh, we're doing a pilot with an induction loop in the operator area. Um, we'll see if it works out. Obviously, it's a tough environment, transit, but if, if, if the loop works out and it works well for those who you know have cochlear implants or whatever it is with with low hearing, maybe it can be something we, we make. Again, this is one of those features that we are not promising, but we are piloting. 
Um, both start with a P, have different meanings. Um, <coughs> beacon wayfinding at, at, at bus stops, this is another thing that we're piloting. Uh, we've heard a lot from the blind community. Um, finding those bus stops is hard, right? Google only gets you, you know, you know, it's like whatever, Google gets you kind of in the area. But you really need to get right to the lollipop in order to really be recognized and know where it is. So if we put beacons in some of those lollipops and we had the technology, whether it was through Google or through MyMTA, potentially, once you got within a certain distance, it would start beeping and guide you right within two feet of, of, of the lollipop pole. Again, another pilot, non-promise kind of thing, but uh, we'll see how it's going. Um, and uh, uh, very, we're hopeful that it could be a helpful function to those with visual disabilities, even if it's not every stop, but we can do some big ones. We'll see where we get to. Yes, sir. You've taken out the lollipops. Yeah, the with electronic lollipop. bus stops. A bus lot of lollipops, lollipops are disappearing. Wherever the bus stop is, we would place beacons. Because the lollipops are so important if you're using the system, you have to put it in front of the bus stop number. What do you mean? The um, you don't actually have to do that anymore, Bert. With bus time, it just you can it shows you nearby stops and. No, you still need to put in need the to number for bus time. It asks you for it. And but it can find you as well. No, it, it certainly can find you. Yeah. yeah. Depending yeah. on which version. And you is there some time. way for those of us who are rather short in stature <coughs> and shrinking yes. that the that the signs and the bus number signs can be put lower down? The lollipops or the electronic signs or anything else? Uh, Redundant yeah. messaging would help. Uh, the only, I cannot promise that. I think we can't put in several screens. Uh, we follow the ADA requirements. But DOT does the stops. But uh, most of the stops that have, um, you know, five minutes or whatever it is that they say are, are getting audible functionality. So DOT is doing that where you push a button. But can they still be just made a little lower? I Standardized in height. I Standardized I in height. Yeah, that's, that's what Edith says. For, uh, both for, for elderly people who are short and do shrink and for people in, in wheelchairs. I hear you. The problem is people got to be able to see. It. There's all kinds of obstructions and people and cars. And, um, you know, you would ask us for shorter. Somebody would ask us for taller. Putting two screens on bus stops, I can make you lots of promises today. That's not what I want. <laughs> so let's move on. Yeah. I'm being as, as transparent as I can be in terms of what's, you are. what's, what's possible. I'm not here to subway. Subways. Oh, boy. We could take five hours on this. <laughs> <laughs> you almost did the meeting. I almost did, right? Thank God there's time. Like, actual time. Um, so the existing, the existing features in our system, uh, we have tactile warning strips. Everybody knows that. We've got about 350 out of our 400, or maybe even more, we might have, out of our 490 stations, we got about 100 and change to go. We are going to try to blow those out, meaning like uh, hook onto a project and see if we can get all our stations in tactile warnings. I'd like button. you to add that to the uh, dashboard. Oh, how many do we have? Sure. But I think in about a year or so, it'll be all over. Yeah. So, we'll so then you remove it. I, I, I hear you. It, it, yeah. We'll and also the build-up. I was very surprised to be at 50th on the local, mm -hmm. and which was always a terrible horizontal or vertical gap. Yeah, tall gap. And they had, they've had they raised the uh, tactile warning strip, so there was not a gap, which was a great surprise. And I'd really like to see that information somewhere. About the gap or about the tactile warning? The, it's built underneath the tactile warning. When they put when in the, the tactile warning strip, yeah, they raised it. But my point is that we need to know where they've done that because there are people who can't get off a gap. Yeah. Much less yeah, get off a gap. But the only places the gaps are ADA compliant are ADA stations. There's nowhere we've raised platforms. But there are lots of ADA stations that have not been raised. And that, we're, we're that's not possible. There's no ADA station that doesn't have a, a, a ADA compliant boarding area. Yeah. They've There's reason, not a single place in the system. Yeah. They've reasoned if the if the gap falls in not being what compliant. What do you want to put on that reason? bed? There are some <laughs> gaps that are actually <laughs> <laughs> You're so Careful. confident. <laughs> there are gaps that are actually compliant <laughs> that are part of our capital program to get fixed. Yes. But when they were put in, the station made ADA, the gap was 100% compliant. But it might have been a nice track worker or somebody else that moved the tracks a little bit, that created the gap. So 
So we track it, but there's a lot of moving different parts. Mm -hmm. But there is no stations that have bump outs that are not AD stations. Um, Question, yes. Alex, sorry to say, but uh, and Sarah can bounce with me because she already got it. Uh, 34th Street Penn Station has, because yep. I can tell you when Debbie was on it, she went, yep. almost and did a flip yep. up. And which train were you at? Hey, yep. 34th and Street. So there, there are yep. some gaps going going out, of yeah, out of compliance. Out of compliance, and they're going to redo both We're redoing them. So so we're redoing them this year. We're making them yes. back yeah. into compliance. Moving this year. on from gaps, another topic we can have is on. We have induction loops at our booths and health points. Uh, we may need pilot some other areas in the station to put induction loops. Very, 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 very challenging topic because like of the wiring in our systems. But we're trying to see if we can use some portable types of loops and other things. Um, but it's on our radar. We do know that like specifically for those who are deaf or hard of hearing, we need more features. Um, accessible metro car vending machines, you know that. The main feedback we get on that is we need clear instructions on how to use them. We'll try to do that, but the truth is, accessible metro car vending machines will be a thing of the past. Soon yes. enough. Yeah. And Omni, uh, we could spend a lot of time on Omni, but Omni has a lot of features and other things that are very um, accessibility friendly. Accessible boarding areas, we just spoke about that in the middle of every platform where the, uh, where the platform has raised a few inches to help us meet the ADA requirement of a two inch uh, vertical gap and a four inch horizontal gap. Anything less than that is ADA compliant, and anything more than that is non ADA compliant. And in the case of, and Edith has brought this up before, in the case of a train line that has three different equipment types on it, like the A, which has 32s, 46s, and 179s, are they all going to meet at the same place? Will they all have the very same clearance uh, for a wheelchair user? Or will each of them have their own gap? Their yeah. own Look, yeah, that's a very, very tough question. The truth is, that is the goal. And, and what does that mean? Some of the old cars don't have the same capability of pressure leveling with the dock and other things. Like the 32s. Uh, like the 32s. Some of the new cars are a little bit more modern and they have some give. You don't see yes. it, but they do um, move a little bit. We are going to try to meet the standard of the new ones because that's the future. Hopefully, you know, there's a two inch plus or minus that we're able to work with vertically. Hopefully, even if there is some give between all of them, um, that there's slight variations in the car height, it's within that tolerance of two inches. But they, I don't think the door lineup is the same on all of those equipment. The door lineup's not perfect as well. I mean, usually, we almost always catch one to the left, one to the right, but sometimes it's a little different. And then we also have the R211, which is coming. That's its own thing. And we'll have completely different door configurations, but they'll be more beneficial for accessibility. Um, Moving on, visual and audio announcements. <laughs> My favorite topic. Yes. Sorry, question? Yes. Yes. Uh, so yes. for 14th Street Union Square, ah. on the Lexington Avenue for Fire and Six, oh. it doesn't have accessible, and it has gap fitters on the southbound platform. It's not an accessible station. And it's yeah. Like yeah. That. And the there's only. Room. There's no good news about 14th Street Union Square. <laughs> it is the most difficult. It's a curved platform uh -huh. yeah, that has yeah. no elevator. Uh -huh. You literally have to dig up. Yeah, you literally have to dig up half of Union Square to do it. Um, you know, it would be several hundreds of million dollars to figure out how to make that one happen. We'd all love to do it, but um, it is one of the feedback we get that people don't always know that, and it is a dangerous gap. We're trying to find out how to get more information about it, but. And we should have it moving the, um, the, the, the platforming area there, right, Bradley's north. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we looked at trying to move it, the yeah. platform, southbound platform. So, north. so you're not on the curve. Off the curve. Yeah. Which but creates, there's also the shuttle. Which creates, any time you move where you get off or on, super tough because you get on at one place, right. then you get off at another, or right. vice versa. Right. So right. there's no easy solution to things yeah. like that. There are things that, um, you know, I'm thinking about, like he's looking at, that would be whole scale changes to this. They're many, many years out, and probably uh, beyond even what I can say today, because that's a promise I really can't keep. Yeah. But it's on our radar. We know that boarding and deboarding, especially the system becomes accessible, uh, it needs to be better. Um, moving on, visual and audio announcements, my favorite topic. What do we have now and what do we have in the future? For now, we just have, um, not just, for mm -hmm. now we have um, you know, uh, illuminated trip maps. We have lots of screens in our stations that are coming up. The screens do have uh, PSA specifically on them. All our countdown clocks, 
um, have visual uh, visual things on them. Our countdown clocks also work with the PA announcements in most of our system, not everywhere yet. Um, uh, specifically on the OEO announcements, we're looking into possibly things that Boston has done where there's an app that can make them audible for you, right? Um, and because we, everything that's visual, right, if you're blind and you can't see what's specifically on one of our new CIC or app front screens, you should be able to screens um, are great. Uh, uh, get it happen. So everybody loves the screens except for the blind folks. So we got to figure out how to, um, um, how to make that better. But we are. Between the Minor TA app and some other apps that can actually read what's on the screen, we may be able to solve that problem. Boston's piloting something like that right now. Even, even, I'm sorry, even sure. underground, where you may not have the same connectivity? Yeah, it's connected by Bluetooth. Okay. The, the screen sends its own Bluetooth signal, right. that app picks it up, the Bluetooth sends it to you within a 30 foot window. What about the audio announcements on the trains that are not yet automated or technical? The, old, the very old subways. Great Is there question. some way of getting the, conduct, the conductors? to speak and say the station until something is installed? Well, uh, most of our new trains have the automated announcement what the next station right. is. The okay. biggest challenge is when they do a manual announcement, like this train's going to do three circles and then do a jump, okay. um, or whatever it is. They're so different and rare. Um, we need to get them into text specifically, so for those who can't hear, it's one of our biggest um, um, uh, things that is raised to us by the community. But the truth is, in the future, um, because of all the screens that will be all over the subway cars, messages from RRCC, our main control center, can go right onto the screens. Uh, if this train is going to change, this train is not going to change. You won't need the conductor's voice to, 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 to do it. And the conductor can and never... also, your accuracy sometimes is only as good as the luck of the draw on which conductor you get. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was going to say. We also, we can't tell our conductors to type out messages while they're moving the train. Yes. That's unsafe. But the people at the RCC and people at other places who are sitting behind computers absolutely can. So there is progress and updates that are coming. Our goal is to make much more announcements automated. And specifically on accessibility, like something that we probably will add later. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Is there a bathroom on this floor? I hate to do that, but. It's not accessible. Not accessible. Not accessible. Welcome to my world. Sorry. There's an accessible one on the other floor, but. We'll see if I we've can. asked. We have. We, we put in a work order. I hear you. Are you getting your doors? No. The automatic doors? No. Yes. No. All right. I'll, I'll follow up on the doors. If you but, could follow up on both of those, that would be great, since this is room, and a lot of this is used for the public. I hear you. I hear you. But um, back to announcements, real quick. Uh, an announcement like uh, "Welcome to Times Square," or whatever. This is an accessible station, or whatever it is. So we may automate that into it. We are also trying to find a way, we're working with both the union and our customer service folks, to also not automate, but find out how to say, the elevator's currently out at the station. Great. So uh, getting that in real time is a little tricky, you but... You need to unlock your phone to do this. Um, huh? But... Latched? Was that you? It's okay. God. Okay. No. But, um... Is that a building? No, no, it was someone's phone. Oh, Stuart's really? phone. Stuart's phone. Yeah, yeah, it's probably a butt call. But, um... Uh, what we may not be able to achieve is real time because we can't send messages to conductors. Right. But if we can give the 